Good morning. morning. Okay, so I'm going to call this message like sheep without a shepherd. Like sheep without a shepherd. Oh, but can I just pray? (laughs) Lord, we do. We have great need. I just, I ask, my God, for the power of your Holy Spirit to rest upon this place, to drive out all the darkness, to take authority over all the lies of the enemy, all the distractions, all the high demonic thoughts that arrogantly exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. I pray that you would take authority here over this atmosphere. And I pray that you would break through. Lord, that your truth would deal a mighty blow to the strongholds and men's minds that hold them captive to the enemy to do his will. Lord, we plead as your people, we plead for the release of the captives. We plead for the opening of the eyes of the blind. We plead, Lord, that the poor would hear and not be poor anymore. Lord, that what you came to do, it would be accomplished. That you would change. You would change men from the inside out. We pray this in... Jesus' name, amen. amen. So if you've <clears throat> been here any length of time, <laughs> you've heard me probably say this a lot, and I just can't stop saying it. I think it's really important that every time you open the Bible, you're given the opportunity to look at the world through divine eyes and through the divine perspective, which we desperately need because we are, by nature, we are bound to this earth, we are bound to time, we are bound to our own perspectives, our whims, our fancies, we're bound to the opinions of people, we're bound, we're bound to cultural trends, we're bound to demonic suggestions. We cannot see truth on our own. We don't have the capacity. And so in the Bible, God gives each one of us the opportunity to step outside of ourselves and to look at things through his eyes, his wisdom. It's like a, it's a window into the divine realm, and we need this. We need to be able to look at things from his perspective. And you can do this as much as you want, as hungry as you are to see things in their true light, you are given the opportunity to do it. It's right there. It's just waiting for you to do it. It will take time for your eyes to adjust to what the Lord shows you because our perspectives are very twisted and distorted. There's a lot of preconceived ideas. There's a lot of built-in and entrenched lies, and it takes time. But as you, as you purpose to look, your eyes will begin to see things that you never saw before. You'll see the world in a different way. You'll see yourself in a different way. You'll see, you'll see what matters and what doesn't matter. You'll see what God loves. You'll see what God hates. You'll see what destroys men's lives and what recreates men's lives. You're given access to a, a wealth of, of wisdom in the Word of God. And one of the things that you're going to see 
if you look, is you're going to see profound things about the nature of God, what he is really like. And you're going to see profound things about us and what we are really like. And you don't really have to go very far. I mean, you just go to the first page and you see some powerful truths about God and you see powerful truths about us. And I'm not even sure why I'm turning there because I'm not going to read anything. But you, you see into the heart of God that one of his deepest desires is to give men a rich, full, abundant life. It's what he wants. He expended tremendous amounts of energy to create a universe that was ordered, full of, full of artistic beauty. God is an artist. God is an architect. God is an engineer. God is, he's a, he's a master at everything. And he spent all of his energy to create an ordered and beautiful and abundant world and universe, and then he gave it to men. He just gave it because this is his desire. And we were given absolute perfection. We were given an existence that was beyond anything that we can ever dream. It was, it was full of purpose. Adam was given purpose. He was given dominion. He was given the right to cultivate and to make what was already beautiful, even more fruitful and abundant. He was given um, Eve as a helpmate. He was given um, communion with God. He was given absolute perfection. And he took that perfection and he destroyed it. By his own will, by his foolishness, by his I don't understand all the dynamics, but all we see is that by his own choice, he took the, the, this thing that God had given him and transformed it into hell. And from there, things got so bad, the earth was so corrupted that God knew that the only thing he really could do was to baptize this world in a flood of destruction and to utterly cleanse it and start over. And he took one family and put them in an ark. It was a type of Christ, a type of salvation, and lifted them high above this flood of destruction and then brought them into a world that looked very similar to the world that Adam had destroyed. It, was no, it didn't seem to be under the curse anymore. It was abundant, it was thriving, it was ready to be cultivated and developed and made what God had originally intended. And yet, <laughs> things didn't really go so well. Very quickly, there was drunkenness, there was sexual deviance, there was rebellion to God's clear authority, there was idolatry and pride, and God had to scatter the people. And you know, it's like this cycle is just repeated over and over and over. God intervenes. He attempts to give men blessings, and men take those blessings and create a hellish existence with what God has given them. We've been given intelligence. We've been given the ability to create. We've been given the, the capacity to innovate and invent, and what have we done? We have not ever yet gone back to that place of blessing. We've all, it seems to only perpetuate the destruction and the misery. We just don't know how to get back there, do we? Despite all of the technological advances and advances in medicine, We've got whole realms of self-help. We've got psychology and psychiatry. We have social programming. We have government. And yet, you know, if you were to look at any culture at any given time and just kind of paint broad strokes, the colors are all black and dark. There's very little light when you look at the history of man. Man just does not know how to live in the purposes of God or in the blessing of God. 
And so now you know why the Lord calls us sheep. This is why the Lord calls us sheep. Um, I read a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. It was just amazing. <laughs> um, let me just read something. This is his own testimony as a sheep farmer. The first sheep farm I purchased as a young man was a piece of derelict land that had been sheeped to death. An absentee owner had rented the place to a tenant who had simply loaded the ranch with sheep and left them pretty much to their own ways. The result was utter desolation. Fields had become so overgrazed and impoverished they would grow little but poverty grass. Little sheep trails had deteriorated into great gullies. Erosion on the slopes was rampant and the whole place was ravaged almost beyond repair. All of this happened simply because the sheep, instead of being managed and handled with intelligent care, had been left to struggle for themselves, left to go their own way, left to the whims of their own destructive habits. I found this book really, really insightful, very interesting. I'd recommend it to anybody. Again, it's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. The parallels between sheep and humans are <laughs> just uncanny. I didn't know any of this. <laughs> but it's like, okay, yep, we're sheep. Let me tell you something about sheep. Sheep long for peace and rest. But their natures are so fragile and easily agitated that it's almost impossible for them to find peace or rest. In order for a sheep to lie down, which it wants to do, it has to be completely free from fear, and they are terrified little creatures. They have to be free from all pests and parasites, and they are just, their, their inner constitution is so vulnerable to these things. They have to be absolutely free from any kind of friction within the flock, and they have to be totally free from hunger. And if they're not given those four things, they will not lie down. They'll stamp their feet. They'll shake their head. They'll wander aimlessly. They will not lie down. Sheep are defenseless. They don't kick. They don't have fangs. They can't secrete poison out of their skin. They can't change their colors. They don't have wings. They're utterly defenseless. And so if you put a dog or a wolf or a coyote or a cougar, it's absolute rampage because they have no defense except to run. They're stubborn, they're self-willed, and they're self-destructive. Listen to what he writes. They are notoriously creatures of habit. And when left to themselves, they will follow the same trails until they become ruts, they will graze the same hills until they turn to desert wastes. They will pollute their own ground until it is corrupt with disease and parasites. The stubborn, self-willed, proud, self-sufficient sheep that persists in pursuing its old paths and grazing on its old polluted ground will end up a bag of bones on ruined land. <laughs> and this is a man who loves sheep. <laughs> who knows what the sheep haters would say, right? So in other words, when, when sheep have no shepherd, they are destined to be miserable, ravaged with disease, impoverished, starving, full of disease, and eventually they die. This is what a sheep is like without a shepherd. And so Jesus comes to his own people, the one who had been given promises the ones who had been given the covenants, the one who had been given the glories of the old covenant, and he found them not peaceful and fruitful and abundant, but full of weak sickness, wasting disease, torn apart and scattered. And he had compassion on them. He was full of pity for them. But really, 
You know, the question is, why? Why were they like this? You know, Jesus had longed to bring them into his fold. He longed to give them everything they need. He, would, he was going to be their shepherd. He would have protected them from their enemies. He would have cared for them. He would have led them to green pastures and still waters. He would have created peace within the flock. So why was it that so many of them stayed in the condition that they were in? Why did they stay like sheep without a shepherd? And why are so many professing Christians like sheep without a shepherd? I'm not talking about being in the church. I'm talking about the reality of their lives. Why do they look like sheep without a shepherd? Why are they not abundant and full and at peace? Why are they ravaged with anxieties and fears? Why are their families torn apart? Why, are their, why do their children commit suicide? Why are they fractured and why? Why do they look like sheep without a shepherd? I've got three reasons. I'm sure there's more, but I've got three reasons. The first is because they neglect spiritual realities. They neglect spiritual realities, and this leaves people like sheep without a shepherd. Proverbs chapter 2, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 1, gives us a picture of this. It talks about how wisdom, wisdom is crying out, and it's, it, it's inviting people. It's saying, if, if you're simple... Turn in here. Come to me. This is wisdom's call. If you're simple, come to me. Simple in in this context means thoughtless. No, giving no thought to things. Just open up, open to whatever comes your way, whatever whim, whatever trend, whatever impulse. You're just wide open. You're just back and forth. You understand what I'm saying? And it goes on to describe what people are like when they are like this, when they're thoughtless. It says, because I called and you refused to listen, stretched out my hand and no one heeded, because you ignored all my counsel and have, would have none of my reproof, I will laugh when your calamity comes. I will mock when terror strikes you. That's not talking about God mocking people. It's talking about wisdom. Wisdom will mock us when we don't listen to her and then calamity comes because we knew what we should have done. And so we're mocked by the thought of the wisdom that we could have had. But now it's just utter desolation. Therefore, they will eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. Hebrews says it a little differently. Hebrews says it this way, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the law proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Albert Barnes writes this, It needs not great sins to destroy the soul. Simple neglect will do it as certainly as atrocious crimes. Every person has a sinful heart that will destroy him unless he makes an effort to be saved. And it is not merely the great sinner, therefore, who is in danger. It is the man who neglects his soul, whether he be moral or immoral. So we must pay much Closer attention. This is like what Pastor Steve was saying, right? When Skip said that we should cry out, what was the response in some? Apathy and lethargy. God is commanding all men to pay much closer attention to what we have heard. That's a command. Pay much closer attention to what you have heard. Otherwise, you'll drift. You'll drift away from it. This is applicable to all. (laughs) Everyone who will be saved must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. And what is the message that we heard? We all grew up in church, right? Most of us, 99%, we grew up in church. We heard a message. What's the message that we heard? We heard that we're fallen. We heard that, we, that in our natures, there is something so 
opposed to God, that we, he comes to us with his call, serve me, worship me, follow me, and our natures say no. Our natures are perverse and stubborn and rebellious. We say, no, I don't want to do what you say. I don't want to give you my life. Now, we might not say that outrightly, but we say it with our lives. When we neglect him, when we pursue everything else but him, we're saying no to him. And so what did God do when he saw that we were like this, all of us like this, like sheep who have gone astray, right? What did he do? He sent a redeemer. He sent Jesus, not to be a judge, not to be a condemner, but to be a savior, to be a shepherd, a guide, a comforter, a keeper. And because of this, what are we commanded to do? Repent. Repent of that self-sufficient, stubborn, self-willed way and turn to him and believe in him to, get, to devote our lives to him. And, and we also heard that if we would do that, God would send us the gracious Holy Spirit to go inside of us so that what we are by nature is no longer stubborn, rebellious, and perverse, but open-hearted, loving, willing. This is the promise. And what he is saying to us is that if you let those truths slide by you, it will profit you nothing. You will not be profited. We'll sit in church. I'm not, I'm not mad. I'm not mad. Okay. I'm actually super chill. <laughs> I, I'm like incredibly chill in real life. And then something happens when I do this or when I talk with people about the Bible, it's just something like comes over me because this stuff is massively important. It's not meant to be treated lightly. This is real. If we let these truths drift, no matter how many times we've heard them, no matter how many church services we've, church services we've been in, we will not be saved. God is asking for a response to his truth, which is the intention of our minds and our wills to hold it, to grasp it. It's like we're in this spiritual atmosphere and all of these truths are going heavenward. There's a, a heavenly current all around us and we can be in it and not be moving in the same direction unless we grab something that is going in that direction and then it begins to move us heavenward. But we have to do it. Much closer attention. Every single person who has been saved at one point has paid close attention to what they've heard. We never drift into heaven. You never drift into heaven. The apostles literally gave their lives for these truths because they saw the result. They saw Jesus. They saw his power. They saw his love and compassion, and they knew what it could do in the hearts of men. It could save them. It could transform them from being People whose lives were so corrupted and so selfish and self-centered, so destructive, so marked by chaos and pain and misery, and it could transform them into sons of the kingdom. It could bring them into that blessedness. But if you've never paid attention, really, then there's no wonder that your life is like a sheep without a shepherd. You've neglected the thing that could change you. All right, the second reason that we are often like sheep without a shepherd is because we have desire problems. We have desire problems. And I'm sure you've heard me talk about this before, but I can't, it's like you can't leave it out when you're talking about something like this. Have you ever realized that you are like a factory of desire. You are an unending factory that is putting out very, very powerful desires. And those desires will take you somewhere spiritually. Now I say that we have desire problems <laughs> because of what James says in his epistle. He says it like this. 
Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And I say that we have desire problems because of what Peter said in his second epistle. He said that the corruption that is in the world through lust. The corruption that is in the world through lust. So it's almost like this. God created this incredibly beautiful universe, and he put within that universe a man and a woman who were called to be his image, his image bearers, his co I don't even know how you say it. They were called to rule. They were called to rule and exercise authority over the creation. And Satan, being filled with rage and hatred against God, he was looking for a way in to this creation because he wanted to bring into this creation sin and misery and death. And he found a door. And that door was in the human heart. And more specifically, it was in our desires. And he has, ever since then, he has found that door over and over and over again with the same results. The same chaos and misery and sin and death has come through the doorway of human desires for 6,000 years. He found that doorway in men like Cain and Nimrod and Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Herod, Caiaphas, Judas, he also finds it in men who are saints, like Noah and Abraham and David and Peter. He finds that door in some way. He found it in you and he found it in me. Most of the time, what we desire is not inherently sinful. This is crucial to understand. Most of the time, the things that we desire are not inherently sinful. And what Satan is trying to do most of the time is get us to take an innocent thing and put it in the place of God. It's an innocent thing it's a thing which was given to us for our blessing. And Satan says, put that in the place of God. And every, sign, every time you do that, you have opened the gateway to hell. Because what we're really looking for in life, in every desire, what we are looking for is something to worship. That's the glory of human nature. The glory of human nature is that we were made to worship. And the fallenness of us is that we will put something other than God in that place. And we'll do it very easily. Our desires are so strong that we will very willingly put something in the place of God and worship it and destroy ourselves through it. We're looking for protection. You can take your strong, any, any one of your strongest desires. And I know what you're looking for. You're looking to be protected. You're looking to be provided for. And you're looking for pleasure. Your strongest desires. You've worshipped them because that's what you think they're going to offer you. The problem is... God is the only one who can do that for you without destroying you. He has promised to be our protection and our provision and our pleasure. And when he is in his rightful place, it is blessing and it is abundance. But when we put something else there, it is destruction. Now at the beginning of this process where we exalt something to the place of God, it doesn't seem that bad. <laughs> it really doesn't. We look at that thing and we think it's going to serve me. And what we don't realize, I don't know if any of this, is this like, is this helping anybody? Okay, I'm just checking. I'm like, is all this like not necessary? 
we put something in the place of God and we think it's going to serve us. But we become its slaves. Because in order for that thing to really protect and provide and give us pleasure, we have to give it our hearts. We have to give it our time. We have to give it our energy and our attention. And slowly but surely, what we thought we would serve us becomes our tyrant and requires everything. And that's what Satan wants. He wants loyalty. He doesn't care if you serve him. But if you serve something other than God, he's got you. He's wielding a power over you that you can't even understand. And what is just, and again, this is why I call it a desire problem, because how many times do we do this? How many times do we go through this cycle? Is it enough for us to feel the pain one time and play, oh, that's it, that's the end of that? No, very rarely do we learn our lesson. Most of the time, we don't really come alive or awake to it until it's absolute misery. And we watch all these people around us doing the same thing. It's always ending in the same result. And what, oh, it'll be different for me. After a million people walk off the same cliff, we're like, oh, I think I can fly. There's actually a really, <laughs> there's actually a really hilarious, kind of hilarious story I was reading in Turkey. Um, one sheep went off a cliff and 1,500 sheep followed. 400, they like sorted out the living from the dead. It was like 400 of them died and then the rest of those 400 dead were like a big fluffy cushion. The, the rest lived, but they all went off the same cliff. They, all of them. Well, I don't know about you, but do, how many, do you want to be sorted among, from the living and the dead? Is, there really, is it really worth it? This is why the Lord warns us so strongly about our desires. He tells us, guard with all diligence your heart, for from it are flowing the issues of life. And anyone who does not diligently guard their hearts, you're like a sheep without a shepherd. You just go wherever your heart takes you, and it always will take you into a path of ruin and sorrow. <clears throat> okay, the third thing that leaves people like sheep without a shepherd is hypocrisy. Um, it, it's often been pointed out that Jesus' harshest words were reserved for the Pharisees. But the reason why he spoke so strongly to them, there's a number of reasons why he spoke so strongly to them. First, they were absolutely entrenched in their unbelief. Second, they were, the le they were posturing themselves as leaders for the people. But the third reason is that they were hypocrites. And, hypo and hypocrisy is a very deadly spiritual disease that, pa that passes through spiritual communities like wildfire. It's highly contagious. And so Jesus spoke very strongly to these men. But why? Why, <clears throat> why is it so deadly? And I... Uh, Yesterday, I pondered this for a while, and I just, it, I couldn't wrap my head around it, so let me just tell you what it does. It does a number of things. Hypocrisy performs a spiritual act in front of people that isn't real. It performs a spiritual act, okay? The, the Greek word for hypocrite is hypocrites. And it literally means an actor. And so what does an actor do? He goes up on a stage and he does things and says things that are not the reality of who he is as a person. He's an actor. He's a hypocrite. Okay, now for some people, the stage is the church. 
their church. Their church is a stage. When they get to church, they assume an act. They do things and they say things that aren't real. They they bow their head during prayer, even though their hearts are, they're just, they couldn't care less about being there. They talk to people that they don't really like. They pretend like they're interested in the sermon. And then when they leave church, they go to work or they go to school. They, they do a different thing because that thing at church was an act. It's just gone because it wasn't real. For some people, the stage is any other person. They have a very strong desire to be seen in a certain light. For some people, they want to be seen as godly. And so anytime someone else is around, they do certain things because they're trying to seem godly. Maybe they really want to be godly. But but what matters is not whether or not they want to, but whether or not they are. What are they like when no one is around? Because if that, when, what they're like when no one is around, is different from what they're like when they're around people, this is the reality, what they're like when they're alone. That's the reality. Everything else is an act. For some people, the stage is all of life. And hypocrisy is so entrenched that act and reality have become blended, and they can't even distinguish the difference. They don't even know they're acting. Okay, another thing that hypocrisy does is it obsesses over external things. It obsesses over external things. So you look at the Pharisees, they intensely cared about washing pots and pans and bowls for ceremonial reasons. They cared intensely about tithing. They would literally take everything they had and separate out a tenth of that, no matter what it was. They had hundreds of Sabbath laws. Apparently the law that had been given to them, you shall do no work on the Sabbath, wasn't enough for them. They had to scrupulously define exactly what that meant. And they obsessed over it. They had separation laws from the Gentiles. I mean, they they were so concerned about being contaminated by Gentiles that they had laws to keep them from accidentally being dusted on by these people. If the dust from a Gentile's feet touches me, I'm unclean. So they have all they have these regulations. And right in the middle of all of that obsession they gave tremendous latitude to evil in their hearts. Rage, lust, hatred, bigotry, self-righteousness, self-love, all of this was given tremendous latitude. It was winked at, it was explained away, it was justified. But not all those outward things. Another thing that hypocrisy does is it distorts the entire purpose of religion. It distorts the entire purpose of religion. Everything that was given to man was given so that we would love the Lord with all of our hearts and we would love our neighbors like we love ourselves. That was the reason for the whole thing. And what hypocrisy does is it takes all of the forms and makes it makes religion for me. Keeps the forms, distorts the purpose. Okay? Does this make sense? So, giving to the poor, giving alms. That form was retained, but the heart was for self. I want the glory of men. Prayer was maintained, but it was selfish and self-centered. Fasting was maintained. The ceremonial dress was maintained, but inside was a heart that was full of wickedness. So here's why hypocrisy is deadly. Here's why it leaves men like sheep without a shepherd. Because 
right in the middle of all this religious activity, right in the middle of the scrupulous law keeping, right in the middle of the maintaining of religious form, the heart is closed to God. It's shut God out and it has shut others out. If God were allowed in, he might keep some of the forms, but he would overthrow their inward life. And because that's not really important, they keep the forms of religion and deny the power, and it's hypocrisy. The heart of hypocrisy, <laughs> what was meant for worship of God and love for man, becomes self-love and self-worship. That's the heart of hypocrisy. And so when we see it in that way, when we, you know, there's no Pharisees left. That it, they don't exist. It was a sect in Judaism. There's no more Pharisees. But the Spirit is alive. The Spirit is alive. And all of us, some more than others, but all of us are vulnerable to this kind of hypocrisy, to hiding behind an image, using the church for selfish gain, putting a rigid emphasis on the outward and minimizing heart purity, condemning people who violate traditions but winking at our own heart sins, exalting the traditions of men, looking critically at those who are unlike us. Is anybody able to say I'm free from this? This leaves us like sheep without a shepherd because... All of this, all of these forms can be lived in the flesh. They can all be lived in the flesh. It doesn't require the involvement of God at all. It doesn't, it doesn't require the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't, it doesn't require His grace. But what does require His grace is the regeneration of the heart to be like Jesus, to, to, to go undergo those spiritual processes that pull us out of the dominion of sin and the devil and to bring us into the kingdom of the Lord. That requires grace. That requires a lot of grace. <laughs> so, let me just read something at the very end because, you know, all of these, all of these things that I listed, um, I can really relate to. I remember when I was in the program, I'd been here for probably seven and a half months maybe, and I went to an altar call. It was like, as, as Pastor, it was Pastor Jeff Colon at the time, as he was preaching, it was like some panic and terror fell upon me right at the end of the, of the message, and I was absolutely beside myself. I was like, God, if you don't show up and do something, I am doomed. I have to have, you've got to work in my life and you've got to do it now. I assumed that was the Holy Spirit because <laughs> I'm not normally like that. And I went to the altar and it was like God got right in my face and he said, you are nothing but a hypocrite. You have no idea what it means to have a relationship with me. And I broke. He showed me my whole life, all the sexual sin, all the religious activity. He said, it's, it's the same in my eyes. There's no difference between all your church actions and your filth. And I began to really pray. And the prayer that I prayed was the prayer for a shepherd. <laughs> Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts, see if there's any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And he did. He did it. I'm very, very thankful. And he's willing to do it for anyone. He's willing to do it for anyone. Left to your own devices, you will be nothing but these types of things. Spiritual neglect. It, just an absolute idolater and a hypocrite. 
and other things, rebellious, you'll be nothing but that, just ruin waiting to happen, but with a shepherd, with a holy shepherd, your life can turn around. So I would just invite, I don't know how we'll close this, the message, but when Pastor Steve or whoever closes, we often invite you to go and spend time with the Lord, right? Do it. Don't, don't take that lightly. It is not enough to be here in the program. It's not enough to be, to be surrounded by spiritual influences. You've got to do it. And if you've been, I'm not trying to, yeah, I'm just, it's a call, right? <laughs> like Pastor Steve said, this is a call. If you have just been drifting and gliding in this program, you're not making any progress. Please, take hold of what you're hearing and start today. Take hold of it. All right? Amen. For more content, subscribe to our bi-weekly video podcast, Pure Life Ministries Sermons, on Apple Podcasts or Podbean. Our bi-weekly audio podcast, Purity for Life, explores how real life meets real Christianity by tackling the tough issues for those struggling with sexual sin. You can subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And you can find all our content on our website, purelifeministries.org.